We met actually uh, not in Australia. We are both from Australia, but we met here in Bangalore one and a half years ago. And we were in a conference and we met by the pool. We, we started to have a conversation and we had a lot, you know, a large number of beers. And uh, under an undefined number of beers, we decided that, oh, why not, why not, let's, let's talk together um, and let's, let's have an idea that we can, we can go on a journey for. Yeah. And uh, our, our journey was around, what is the ideal number of team members? Mm -hmm. And after, like, probably we had about 10 beers. <laughs> and yeah. we, th we decided that's, that seems like the perfect number. Uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe that magic number is 10, like, the, you know, it probably matches the scrum guide. It, it would be in that range. So yeah, we yeah. thought, yeah, let's, let's try to prove it, that 10 is the magic number. And in yeah, every yeah. team, we should have 10 people. Yeah. And uh, so what we decided, that not, not just look at Scrum and all the stuff that you know, but we, we looked a little bit of everything else. Mm -hmm. And we started with history. Mm -hmm. So I went on to Google and Wikipedia and did my older research about what happened back in the Paleolithic times. And uh, what I find in the middle, of middle Paleolithic, which is about 30 to 300,000 years ago, they were already forms. And the forms, the smallest unit of, the, of a team was uh, a family. And uh, families, you know, they had varying numbers, but they actually formed together what they called bands. And in these bands, there were 20 to 100 people maximum. But when there was a lot of abundance, a lot of resources, or they had, you know, mating or, or a big celebration, they formed macro bands. So a couple of bands got together. It's their version of scaling, I guess. <laughs> and uh, the other thing what is interesting we, uh, is it's not just the number, it's the roles. So what you found that in these, th in these families and in, in these bands, everyone was like the T-shape. They were all cross-functional. Right. So they didn't have their own, this is my task, I'm hunting, you gathering. Everyone had the minimum skills for survival. Mm -hmm. So everyone, if, if they are alone, they could survive on their own mm -hmm. for a while. Yeah. Um, the other thing was very interesting, and it, it resonated with the holacracy that we learned. They actually didn't have a leader. They didn't have a chief. So communal consensus was the form of decision making back in the middle Pale Paleolithic. So coming closer, uh, then I ex uh, experimented with, sorry, I checked the Roman army. Mm. And with the Roman army, um, well, first of all, in ancient Rome, they formed uh, tribes. And the tribes were about 1,000 people. And it was held, uh, the leader of that. So they had a leader called the tri Tribune. And they had centurions, uh, around 100 people. and Decuries. And then I said, yeah, I found the answer. It's 10 because the decuries, the smollest unit, right. had held by, uh, led by the curio, is 10 people. So the Romans must have known it, I thought. <laughs> but then I had a look at the army. And the army has, they had 30 legions. And in every legion, they had 5,500 people. And they formed, it was very similar. So it was, um, it was led by one person. And they had so-called cohorts. And in one cohort, they had... Um, so they had 10 cohorts and um, 10 again 10, ten. Uh, what a surprise right mm, yeah. 30 legions but in, in each of the legions they had 10 cohorts and the cohorts had about so they had I think 480 people nine of them and one was a special cohort with with um, I think let me check 800 people just to make sure the numbers match up and in the cohorts they had uh, centuries with 80 men and um, and that was kind of their smallest unit then I thought, okay, so uh, at least I could find some, you know, evidence for ten people and not ten people. <coughs> I had a look at ancient Japan and uh, ninjas. You know, ninjas they work usually alone, but sometimes they form teams. But it was never more than probably four people because they had to be, you know, when they when they got in somewhere to kill someone, they they, they cannot be many. So they they were very much focusing on small <coughs> teams, very yeah. small teams, quite often just one person. On the contrary, samurais are like the scaled version of ninjas. They, this is their formation. So in, 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 uh, in, the, in called Honjin Sonai, they had over 1, 1,500 people, 1,500 people with all different roles. So what you can see here, let me just show you here. So these are completely different units with strictly defined roles, right? So it, was, it wasn't cross-functional. Everyone knew exactly what they had to do. There were, Archery. There were cavalry. There were there were people with uh, spears, uh, spear units, and standard units. So I thought, okay, I, I I just cannot seem to find an answer. It seems that you know one person team, 
1,500 person team, they are just work fine. So I looked at something that you might be more familiar with, uh, the Indian Army. And uh, I, I'm not a specialist in here, so please, if, if, if I'm wrong, just I'm happy to fail. It's okay. My, uh, my source is uh, indianarmy.nic.in. But what I found here is the smallest unit is called a section. And how many people in the section? What do you think, Alex? Uh, I would say 10 because that's the perfect number. Absolutely, right. So absolutely right. And they are uh, led by a section commander. And they go up to platoon. So uh, there are three sections in the platoon. So about 30 people. And then you go into a rifle company, another three. So it's 90 people. And then you go into a battalion, which has uh, four rifle companies. So that's 360 people, mm, if I mm. count correctly. I, I didn't continue the numbers because it just became too large and I couldn't count. And then I thought, okay, the answer must be 10. Right. What does spirituality say, Alex? Well, you started to study the history and how the Paleolithic times, the tribes, the Roman legions, the samurai, the ninja. Uh, so you started to get into human history. But beyond human military history, there's also spiritual history that proves 10 is the perfect number. Uh, the Ten Commandments. Here we have the Ten Startup Commandments, but once again, the perfect number is expressed in a variety of religions. Um, Christianity, uh, it's not just expressed only in Christianity, but in a variety of other religions as well. Sikhism, 10, that's right. There's 10 uh, gurus, I believe it is, right? These are the 10 gurus here. Again, uh, another part of the world, another culture, uh, not even connected in, in, in uh, terms of like uh, basis for the formation of the religion, but once again, coming back to that human principle, um, that essence, that 10 is the perfect number. And it's reflected in a variety of ways across our religious landscape. Um, tithing, which is a concept of donating to your religion, uh, was traditionally 10% of your income. So whatever you earned, you gave 10% to your church, whatever that church may have been. Once again, 10 commandments, 10 gurus, 10% 10 of your income to support your religion. And it's not just in established, uh, large uh, established religions, right? It's also in numerology and other aspects, uh, spiritual aspects of our society. Here's how it's reflected in a variety of different ways in our societies. 10 uh, is considered to be a spiritual number. It has numerological significance in a variety of cultures. These are just some of the words that describe what the number 10 meant to ancient cultures, like the Greeks and the Romans and the Indians and the Chinese. It's all about uh, karma and perfection and harmony. Uh, it was even significant in the ancient civilizations of Mesopotamia and Egypt. And it's not just in spirituality and religion and the military and historical significance. It's also reflected today in sports, which I guess is kind of the whole human band thing again, right? Yeah, and, and what we did is how, do, how are sports team formed and what are the roles there? Because right. the perfect number we all know now it's 10, so we yes. had a look to prove it in the area of sports. Right. Now, there are 750 sports played around the world, and more than 200 are actually recognized by a national or an international federation. And while individual sports are very popular, so are team sports, so I had to look at the team sports. And of course, if I come to India, I had to look at cricket. Of course. And I didn't know cricket, so I watched uh, Lagan, which hopefully you are familiar with. And what I found is it's an almost perfect sport because it has 11 players. That's so close to perfect. Very close. Yeah. Very close. And you all know the rules. So one team is bowling, the other team is betting. And what, I've, what I learned here is that actually skills are pretty important. So have you seen this movie, by the way? All right, so you remember Bhuvan Amir Khan is like the main character, but there are, and he's good at everything. So he truly seems like a cross-functional leader of the team. But there are others like Kashra, who is a fantastic spinner. And he has, I think, the only hat trick in history. Uh, well. It's in a movie, so. Uh, <laughs> but he was not very good at betting, uh, but he did a hat trick. So he was very, he had very, very special skills in that yeah, team, yeah. And, and that held against the English. But when I look at another Indian sport, Kabaddi, maybe it's not as perfect because it's seven players in each. It's team. close, though, it's close. It's close. Yeah. And, and you have a special role there as well, a, ra a raider. 
And uh, by the way, anyone supports the Bangalore Bulls? Well, you know, they are champions, they are pretty good. Uh, I only watched a couple of matches just to make sure I'm coming prepared and I just <laughs> not just BS through the whole, you know, like Kabaddi. Um, but it's a pretty interesting sport. And, and um, then again, showed that how important that you have a team uh, who are actually trying to, um, trying to fight against the radar here. Um, had, a lot, had a look at a couple of other sports and, and yeah. then I, I thought, okay, the perfect number, the perfect sport must, must be lacrosse. And softball, because they have 10 players. Yeah, yeah, that's a perfect number, after all. I think so. Yeah. So I think if you take one person out of cricket, could it be the perfect sport? It might be. Oh, it's the perfect sport anyway, right? Um, and then, then I had a look, okay, maybe, maybe, maybe sports, maybe that's 11. I, I have to be more precise. I have mm. to look at some other things. Yeah, yeah. Let's have a look at nature. Right. What happens with animals? Do they form a team of 10? What do you think? Yeah, some of course, of, of course. So Wolfpack is, is a perfect example. Uh, you see different numbers here. They are from two different sources. So one of them said that most of them have six or seven mem members, but can go up to 15. The other said five to 11, sometimes with huge packs of 42. Right. But 10 probably is in that range, so it must be still the perfect number. Four packs of 10, perhaps. Four packs of 10, that's right. What, was, what I also found fascinating is the roles within a Wolfpack. So, uh, you, have you read Eliyahu Goldratz, The Goal? So you remember in, when they go on a, on a journey and Herbie is kind of the slow kid and everyone, the, they cannot form a line and they yeah. realize the slowest person must be at the, at, the line, at the start of the line. So wolves know that. They didn't have to read Goldratz's book. <laughs> they ha actually have the oldest and slowest wolves in the, start of the, in, in the front of the wolf pack. So they set the pace. It's not the fastest, it's the slowest setting the pace. Right. So they are always together. And the leader is actually in behind, so making sure that the alpha male, uh, sorry, alpha, alpha, yeah, the dominant leader of the pack stay behind. So actually um, that wolf is kind of caring for the others, protecting them. Um, I found it very fascinating. This one has more than 10, wolf, 10 wolves, so it's probably not the perfect pack. Yeah. Because I think 10 is still the perfect I number. I would agree with you. And then I read about the Bengali tigers. And they are endangered species probably because they don't hunt in packs of 10. They, they do it alone. They lead solitary lives and they hunt individually. So only some of the female tigers actually can cross territory, but only for mating purposes. So they, they, are, they, are, they, they don't form teams of 10. If I would be their consultant, maybe I would... Cons form, know, form packs of 10. And then I would suggest yeah, that, yeah, yes, right. and be cross-functional. I don't know. Right. Sorry, I'm just making that up. Uh, Indian elephants, they actually uh, living in herds. And the herd cons can consist to eight, from 8 to 100 individuals. So it's often you see 10, 10 bachelor's elephants together. Right. So I think, does that really support I my I think theory? so. It does okay. make sense. Okay. So it's, wolf can be packs of 10, tigers cannot be, and they are endangered, but mm. elephants can be packs of mm. 10 too. It mm. must be the perfect number. I would agree. In fact, uh, it, the same things expressed in ants, and not only ants, but robots. Uh, Researchers have discovered that in large ant colonies and also in uh, uh, situations where uh, robots are used, uh, they'll maximize their potential uh, in about teams of 10. So you can't have more than 10 ants at the same time in a tunnel, digging a tunnel. And it's the same for robots as well. If you're familiar with uh, Roombas and other uh, robots that clean houses and stuff like that, if you put 100 Roombas into your house, it wouldn't be efficient at all, but if you had like around 10, that's when you get the maximum efficiency. So ants, wolves, elephants, robots, not just nature, but I guess artificial intelligence, all seems to agree that 10 is the perfect number. And it's reflected in other ways across our universe, in society. Uh, our numbering system is the decimal system, right? Uh, we have 10 fingers on our hands. And all our numbering systems are based on 10 used in society. Here's the original uh, numbers from Arabic, right? And then the Roman numerals that we're familiar with in Western society. Uh, the metric system based on 10. Most of the countries in the world use the metric system based on 10. 10, the perfect number, just seems to make sense. It's reflected everywhere. Money, right? Money, most units today are based on 10, once again, the decimal. And in science, 
Now this is where we get into some real hardcore stuff, Gabor, because now we're going to get into the stuff that reinforces all these observations that you and I have made, right? We've talked about the military, history, spirituality, religion, uh, what happens in nature, but there's actual research that actually reinforces all of this stuff. And it mostly centers around this number. This is known as Dunbar's number. So what is Dunbar's number? Dunbar's number is the generally accepted number of the maximum uh, efficiency of a tribe of human beings, which is around 150 people. Uh, generally, most researchers would say that there's a range between 100 to 250, with the optimal number being 150. So you might have heard of Dunbar's number before. So where does it come from? OK, so what happened was a researcher named Dunbar uh, was trying to figure out um, the maximum or the most efficient size of primate tribes. So what are primate tribes? They're like apes and chimpanzees and monkeys. And he's a researcher who thinks about uh, how do we develop social skills. So he went out into the wild and all these remote locations and he studied chimpanzees and primates and apes and observed them. And what he discovered was that these tribes of primates tend to kind of form around groups of 150 primates. And why was that, the, why was that so? Um, it's because they don't have natural language. So 150 primates is the maximum number of primates that can get together in a group and survive. Because the other part of their time besides surviving is from grooming. You know how we groom and scrum or refine and scrum? Well, that's not the kind of grooming he meant. He meant like this kind of grooming, you know, where you like groom stuff off your thing, right? So when you have more than 150 primates, they spend so much time grooming that they actually can't survive. They starve to death. So he then applied this mathematical formula, which he uh, observed different primates along, and he discovered that humans actually have the maximum efficiency rate of around 10 people. The reason humans can go down to 10 people is because they've replaced physical grooming with language. So language, or otherwise known as gossiping, is the human form of social grooming. And if you take that mathematical formula, he discovered that about 10 people is the perfect number of people in a human tribe where they can be maximally efficient and yet still gossip about each other. So uh, you see this reflected in other ways, in, in sympathy groups that form in animal tribes. They'll also have communication techniques that maximize around 10 to 12 individuals. And if you apply uh, Metcalf's law to it, you may have seen this before, it's about communication pathways. You take the number of people on your team uh, and you multiply it by the number of people minus one on your team divided by the people on the team. 10 is essentially the perfect number where you get the maximum potential amount of communication on a team of humans without going too far up the scale. So there's science behind this, Gabor. It's like a real thing. When I, when I organize my birthday drinks, it's always around 10 people. Exactly. Uh, and in fact, uh, there are other, there's other research out there that says uh, even though 10 seems to be a perfect number, this particular research says that for high impact groups, it was somewhere around six, which I guess is more in line with the, the ninja groups, but I'm still going with 10 as the perfect number. Close enough. <laughs> and in fact, uh, if you've ever played uh, tug of war, there's the Ringelman effect. What that says is you, as you add more people to a team, they actually become less efficient and do less work. Because there's more people to do the work, each individual does less work. Once again, around 10 people is the perfect amount of people on a team where they do the right amount of work and you maximize your efficiency. And how does this relate to Agile? Of course, you're familiar with these ones, right? Yeah. So if, if you look at XP, XP has these seven roles. So um, my research is, here is Wikipedia, uh, but, um, but what it says, Wikipedia said that XP only works on teams on, on 12 or fewer people. Right. Um, however, it suggested that one way to um, go, uh, go against this limitation is to break up the project into smaller pieces um, and, and to, to, to have smaller groups. 
And uh, similarly, Scrum, uh, you're familiar with Scrum talks about like having one product owner, one Scrum master, and a development team of three to nine people, which is if I add them up together, it's like seven to 11, uh, sorry, right. five to 11. Yeah. Um, where 10 is, 10 is between five. That's right. 10 is between five to, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. It is. And um, so, because if you have more than nine members on, in the teams, it, it requires too much coordination. Mm. But if you have less than three, then you know you don't have necessarily all the skills required. Right. And what does Safe say? Safe say pretty much the same thing. So if you look at Scaled Agile Framework, it talks about an Agile team of five to 11 people. That's including product owner and Scrum Master. Right. Um, DSDMA turn, anyone heard of DSDMA turn? No. Yeah, no one ever No knows. one ever. <laughs> I, I have a certification in it and I never used it. But it has 12 roles and, and uh, if I add up the numbers, I played around with it, you have to have somewhere between five to 12 people in the SDMA turn in a team as well. Mm. So I think 10 is still a good number. Mm. What do famous people say about this, Alex? Ah, well, uh, Jeff Bezos from Amazon in Seattle essentially says that teams should be two pizza, two pizza teams. Now, you might not want me on your two pizza team, <laughs> right? I can eat a whole pizza. I'm sure you can too, but still, right? It's about two slices per team member, right? I suppose if you're a responsible pizza eater, it's probably around 10 people. Uh, Troy McGinnis said Agile 2018 in uh, San Diego last year was talking about uh, large teams and it kind of stirred up a little controversy. He was a keynote and he suggested that large teams were a way you could handle dependencies because you could have more people on the team handling uh, sections of the value stream. And it was quite controversial because most Agilists tend to agree that around 10 people is the perfect size for an Agile team. Talking to Chet Hendrickson uh, back in 2015, he said that in every team of 100 people, there's a team of 10 waiting to get out because a team of 10 people can actually accomplish something while a team of 100 people won't. Jim Benson, the inventor of personal Kanban, 10 people, the perfect number where introverts on the team don't necessarily have to talk to other people on the team. But more interestingly enough, Jim Benson said this after he said the, uh, the next thing after he said this. A small group can accomplish anything, but a large group can only talk about accomplishing almost anything. Right? So even the leading luminaries in our field seem to agree that 10 people is the perfect number for the, for the number of people in a team, Gabor. I still agree with you. <laughs> uh, so what, what do you think the perfect, what do you think the perfect team size is? I'm, I'm not sure anymore. I mean, we, we talked about all the time about uh, perfect team size. Of course, yeah. if you take common sense, I don't think there is a perfect team, perfect team size. Are you sure about that? I put it up there on the slide. Yeah. I wrote that. So there is no perfect team <laughs> size. <laughs> yeah. So is there a perfect number? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think there is a perfect number. Is there a perfect recipe? I don't think there is a perfect recipe for any team. And is there a perfect methodology, a perfect framework for whatever team? There is no. There is no silver bullet. We talk about 10 people, but there is absolutely no perfect number. Yeah. There are more important things than numbers. Mm. First of all, understand that people are complex, right? So we move in a complex area. There is no best practice, even no good practice. If you take Kinevin, Kinevin suggests you probe, you sense, and you change. So you try things, you get the feedback, and then you change based on the feedback. It's important still to have a reasonable number, number of people on the team. Is 10 a reasonable number? I think it's a reasonable number. So still. it may not be the perfect number, the solution to everything, but it's a reasonable number. I think it's still a reasonable mm -hmm. number. Have you worked with teams over 20 people? Yeah. How was communication? Did you have your 20 best friends? <laughs> <laughs> You, you cannot, and, and I, pr I just had a, sh a chat uh, with Shane Hasty, and he told me that I think there, is, there are cross-functional people of 70 people, and it's work, working fine. I've never seen anything, uh, yeah. you know, uh, over 15 is getting very, very difficult. So yeah. I think having, thinking through the reasonable number is still important. Right. And what you talked about the tug of war, what yeah. is important, if you add more people to the team, it will not lead to better performance. Right? If you, if you are in project management or if you are working and you, you have deadlines, quite often what happens, people just say, oh, let's have more resources. That will not solve the problem. In fact, it actually gets worse most of the time. Yeah. It changes the culture of the team. So as, as, as soon as you add someone in, 
uh, with new skills, even if the person is a nice person, it changes the whole yeah. culture of the team. And uh, when you talk about what is important in a team dynamics, it's, it's a lot more about trust. So uh, taking away people or adding people will change the trust and it, it will change the team dynamics. And um, if you've seen uh, Margaret Heffernan's talks about super chickens, if not just Google it and go into TED, um, she refers to an MIT research where she had, there are three things that most, most highly performing teams have. They have no dominant voice, and there, that means also that there is no free ride. They have high EQ, and they have more women on their teams. And of course, you're familiar with Google's Project Aristotle. Mm. Not, are are, are you familiar? It. Are, okay, so if you're not familiar, that was a couple of years ago. Google did a research on its 180 teams internally. What, what makes the highest performing teams high performing? And they had their uh, theories that it probably the high IQ or, or certain attributes, but what they found, it was a lot more about social norms that made those teams high performing. And they found five key things. And the number one things that you probably heard because it's, it's a bit of a buzzword, but it's the most important things is having psychological safety within your team. And that is, if, can we take on the risk? Can we take on risk in this team without feeling insecure, feeling embarrassed? Right? If you think about you have a good idea and your manager, you're, you have the risk that, oh, I, I better don't say that. You don't have the psychological safety, but high performing teams, people have that. The second one was dependability. Can we count on each other? If, I, if, if you say that you will do things, will you do the things or will you not? The third thing was structure and clarity. Our goals, roles, and execution plans are clear. And again, I could resonate with the holacracy. I know what I'm responsible for and I know what you're responsible for. Mm. And we know that we can count on each other. And of course, meaning of work and the impact of the work. Are we working on something meaningful that will make a difference? Or do we fundamentally believe in what we do matters? Those were the five things that Google found. You think this is more achievable in a small team context, Gabor? Team of 10? Yeah, <laughs> maybe. Maybe yes, yeah, maybe yeah. yes. But whatever team you have, don't forget these uh, five things. What you need to ask is, what is the goal of this team? Why, are we, why am I building this team? Why am I creating this team? And what are the skills needed? And what type of the people are needed to address all the required skills? Yeah rather than just a number. Mm. So maybe magic number is not 10. There are more important questions. That's what I found. Yeah. Well, thank you for attending today. Uh, this is the link to the presentation. So the link to the presentation is in the presentation. We will share this later. So uh, feel free to go check it out. This was this kind of represented our, our journey of research, right? Absolutely. Yeah, and it's 10 beers at least. And, and, and of course, if, if you want to have a couple of beers, maybe 10 beers tonight with us, we will be here. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.